My name is Bree Northam and I will be your guide today. The artifact we will be looking at is this digital file from a stereograph of Lieutenant Commander William Barker Cushing. This digital file of William Barker Cushing is from 1864. It is a very valuable artifact to understanding Cushing's life and career, along with what's going on in the world and how advanced the technology was. Unlike now, how we can just use our smartphones to take tons and tons of pictures, they had wet plate photography and stereoscopes. The stereoscopes, as you can see in the picture, takes the photo and uses a stereograph to provide a 3D-like viewing of a photo. It achieves this by having two nearly identical images placed side by side on a piece of cardboard. The person viewing the image would then use a special viewer, as seen here. This special viewer would combine the two nearly identical images into one and allow it to appear with 3D effects. The stereograph and stereoscope was created in the 1850s. However, it did not become super popular until the later half of the 1900s. Stereographs were often used to document historical events and people. We might not know they are from stereographs, but we would likely recognize some of the pictures taken by them. Of Theodore Roosevelt. He was the 26th president and did a lot of good for our nation. You may have seen this photo before and just not realized it came from a stereograph. The person in this specific digital file from a stereoscope or stereograph is Lieutenant Commander William Barker Cushing. Sadly, when he was at a young age of just five, his father passed away and his mother was left to raise four sons and one daughter on her own. Although he did not have many connections with his dad passing away so early in life, he did have a close family friend who was elected for U.S. Congress and arranged for William at only 14 years of age to serve as a page in the House of Representatives. The following year, with now more connections, he was appointed to join the U.S. Naval Academy. William Barker Cushing attended the U.S. Naval Academy from 1857 until March 1861. While in the academy, he was known as quite the jokester and was not the most stellar student. He received numerous demerits but kept the number down enough that he was not kicked out. He received, he played pranks and jokes on his history teacher rather than paying attention in class. This did almost cost him as he was about to graduate and almost failed his final exam in Spanish class. Luckily, they did need all the, midshipmen, all the midshipmen they could get since the Civil War, although it had not started yet, was still the talk of the town. After graduating from the Naval Academy, he served in the United States Navy from 1861 until 1874. He happened to have officially joined the Navy right when the Civil War broke out, in April of 1861. He is most famously known for leading the small team that sank the Confederate iron-clad ram CSS Albemarle. The mission of the Confederate CSS Albemarle ship was to clear the Roanoke River of all Union ships. This specific ship had been built differently than the other iron clots. It was designed with 30-degree sloped sides and an octagonal look. This build enhanced speed and stability. They sank it with a spar torpedo. A spar torpedo has a bomb placed on the end of a long pole and attached to a boat. To use it su successfully, you run the bomb or spar side into the enemy ship. Usually, the spar side had a barbed spear at the end, so it would stick to the wooden holes of the enemy ship. They would light a fuse and it would blow up the other ship. It blew up the other ship so incredibly that it would cause it to sink. Although he and his team sank their ship, the ship they were on also had some damage. He ended up alone in the water and had to swim back to the shore. He almost drowned twice because of how difficult the swim was and how tired he was from fighting. 
After the sinking, he became a national celebrity and was promoted to the highly honored rank of Lieutenant Commander. He also received the Medal of Honor. He became a symbol of victory for the Union, not only because of this sinking, but his other victorious leadership shown throughout the war. You can imagine being in the United States Navy in the time of the Civil War would be drastically different than being in the United States Navy now. A major factor that stands out is that because the Civil War was going on at the time, this meant anyone in the U.S. Navy was going out on different missions, whether it be of the sea or on land. They were fighting against the Confederates. A question I have been asked before regarding this digital file is what was the uniform comparison from the 1860s to the 2020s? In this image, on the left, and the main artifact we've been studying today, you can see the Navy uniform from the 1860s. In the image on the right, you can see the modern day United States Navy uniforms. As you can see, the 1860s look is a lot more formal. However, the modern day uniforms look a lot more practical. Using primary sources is very important when conducting research. I used the Library of Congress to find my primary source. Most websites are reliable if they end in edu, org, or gov. However, just being a reliable source does not make it a primary source. A primary source is a document, first-hand account, artifacts, or creative works. This can include diary entries, speeches, interviews, paintings, pictures, meeting notes, clothing, buildings, furniture, and so much more. They are only considered primary if it was created by someone directly involved, it's analyzing the data directly recorded, or it's providing original information. There are many great and easy to use websites to help you find primary sources, like the Library of Congress database, Credo, EBSCO, and Infobase. Thank you so much for joining me on my tour today and listening about all the history behind it. All of my sources will be down below in the description.